Right. Next up on our uh, radical ideologies in the 19th century is going to focus on anarchism. Uh, and I mentioned that earlier, that is considered a far left um, uh, ideology because it is uh, socialized, focused more so on the collective, uh, and it is willing to use violent means to achieve that. Uh, it does differ from Marxism, and uh, they have a, a semi-similar end goal, but they have a different means of achieving that goal, uh, which we'll talk about uh, as we go. But it's basically, uh, they support instead of uh, a particular race or a class, they argue for all humanity um, as a whole, and they are against any sort of coercive hierarchy, whether that's a state system, it's usually a state system, but it's any hierarchy where you're forced to comply with um, a specific set of rules or um, um, uh, hierarchical order. Uh, so anarchism, uh, I think the first person to talk about it was, uh, I think his, name, his first name was William, his last name is Godwin, first name might be wrong, but uh, Godwin, uh, he was the first person, he was the first one to have these ideas, ideas about not having a government or returning to a time where there is no social structure uh, had been thought of before. But he's the first person to form it into an ideology uh, and give it reason. Uh, but we're not going to focus on him in the 1790s, kind of uh, uh, developed the ideology. ideology. The one we're going to focus on, and he wasn't the first, uh, but he's probably the most prominent uh, of the 19th century, uh, was a gentleman by the name of Mikhail Bakunin. And uh, he's going to be particularly popular because he's very active, very proactive. He's a very strong supporter of anarchism. And he has a uh, solid argument behind it, or at least what appeared to be a solid argument at the time. Uh, and uh, many people still agree with the tenets of these uh, ideals. So anarchism, as I mentioned, is opposed to a state. And Bakunin was very much opposed to a state, opposed uh, to a coercive uh, state or hierarchy uh, because he would argue that um, you under the auspices of some sort of uh, enforced hierarchy, particularly state uh, are no matter what the scenario for the most part you are a, uh, you are a slave of that, that system or entity uh, so this, uh, the idea that states uh, enslave uh, individuals and to actually practice freedom, slash deprive you of, of uh, freedom. Uh, and to actually realize uh, freedom, you should actually be focused more on um, collective cooperatism, and um, that would enable you to actually be free and, and go out and do uh, as you please with others uh, without any sort of uh, arbitrary state um, limitations. So why would he think this? So he, he's particularly famous for a couple of reasons. Number one, he really actually did a, a good job of articulating why he was opposed to a state. So he opposed state for several reasons. Uh, number one is that you're de facto a slave of that state. Uh, if you disobey that state, uh, whether it's run by an individual or a group in the form of like an oligarchy or a direct or, or representative democracy, whatever it is, uh, you are essentially a slave of those policies. And if you disobey them, the state has the right to punish you or limit you uh, or kill you based on those uh, limitations. So. Um, he, uh, again, believed that they were enslaving, but he thought that states were predicated on a false premise. Um, and most adherents of the far left, particularly anarchists, but including Marxists too, uh, are under the belief that the need for a state or society or social order or an enforced hierarchy is um, a fabricated um, viewpoint or has a fabricated viewpoint about human nature. So uh, he uh, argued against, argued, against uh, Hobbesian views of human nature. And if you recall Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, the uh, English philosopher from the uh, uh, 17th century and a, an, an early influencer on the idea of a social contract, um, which, by the way, uh, Bakunin is going to oppose wholeheartedly, um, they believed that human nature was uh, violent and aggressive, emotional, uh, intuitive, and it would uh, ultimately lead to uh, suffering and a, a, a quick demise, uh, probably an unenjoyable demise. Uh, so he was very much based on the uh, thought, Hobbes did, that you needed a state to provide order and that 
some sort of social contract should be formed where people agree to a fixed hierarchy or set of rules that they abide to and that are that maintain order because without order without society without a, a state system you would uh, devolve into this sort of primitive chaotic impulsive uh, and violent state that uh, jeopardized your existence uh, reduced your quality of life and, and uh, would, would inevitably end in uh, a lower average lifespan for most individuals. Uh, but Kuhn argued that this was a lie. Um, I'm not sure that he necessarily thought Hobbes in particular knew what he was lying about, uh, but he believed at least the idea of the necessity for a state system and this idea of human nature was incorrect. Uh, so he was against this view of human nature uh, as uh, violent, uh, chaotic, uh, uncivilized. Well, that's what he argues that they are uncivilized. Uh, violent, chaotic, dangerous. Um, he actually argued that uh, humans were inherently far more altruistic uh, and collectively oriented, uh, and that in order to actually be truly independent and free and not have these binding coercive laws and rules, uh, you had to actually act cooperatively with others. So you were kind of doomed on your own, so you were forced to uh, well, not forced to, but you were necessarily compelled to for your own existence to cooperate with others. So he believed that this human nature was um, not uh, erratic, irrational, uh, and violent, and that without rules and systems, humans would naturally cooperate, cooperate freely with one another to promote their own well-being and the well-being of others. Uh, so argued that human nature, nature was... Um, more altruistic than that, altruistic, cooperative, and uh, uh, did not did not need did not require require social constraint. You would certainly and inevitably have some norms um, because you wouldn't want to be offending or violating others, and you would threaten your own existence. Certainly, if you want to take a self-centered perspective, but. Um, he was very much against, as are anarchists in general, against a fixed set of laws that are determined by others that you have to abide by. Um, so, what did he favor then? Uh, he believed that uh, you shouldn't have a society and people should ultimately, uh, and this is similar to uh, the Marxist uh, socialist uh, communist phase, uh, he agreed uh, on the premise that uh, society well, shouldn't exist, first of all, as a, a defined society, but that we instead uh, needed to uh, function as, uh, how can I phrase this, decentralized, meaning there's no like uh, central authority or government that tells you what to do. So your own community sort of does what it does uh, uh, amongst each other collectively. Decentralized federations uh, that operated freely uh, and ran their own own factories or uh, production, however it might be, collectively. And again, he did not believe that there was this need for a state, that human nature was not at its root chaotic and violent and aggressive, and that um, the competition uh, with others was actually driven by this narrative that was fabricated or created by um, the early uh, the early state uh, creators who had, through force uh, and their own self-interest and surplus, uh, much like Marx suggested, sort of created their own um, social system to protect their property and their um, uh, wealth and surplus for themselves. So he's definitely in favor of collective uh, ownership. So collective ownership and cooperation very much opposed to uh, self-interest and private property, and uh, much like uh, Marxists were. We'll get to uh, in a second where he really broke away for, and criticized Marx directly, by the way, uh, and became so incredibly popular. Uh, so he was against the Hobbesian view. And again, I want to emphasize this. He believes it's fabricated. So he believes that uh, not only is it not true that people invented this idea of needing a society and a social system to protect uh, the ones that had the property and power. So it was an uh, idea for states created by those who held property and power. 
uh, that basically the people that are um, uh, working for them or under them in these state systems were tricked into it, into thinking it was necessary, uh, and that it was, a, it was a continued lie, whether it was knowingly a continued lie or not, it certainly originated as a continuing lie, uh, but it was a, a lie about human nature that was um, uh, basically, what's the word I'm looking for? Not propagandized. Um, when you convince others to, uh, to uh, adopt their, your worldview. Indoctrinate. It indoctrinated uh, uh, people through uh, education uh, that they needed these states to maintain peace and order when he argued that actually you have peace and order without a state and the state was invented just to uh, allow those who have property and power to keep that uh, away from others and, and control and exploit them. Again, that was similar to uh, Marx's critique, um, although Marx is more focused on, on class conflict than uh, humanity versus coerced hierarchy. All right, so um, they're created by those that property. And he actually argues that states make things worse. It's not just that they aren't needed, but they actually make things more violent. So he would ar argue that uh, argued states can't exist peacefully. States cannot exist peacefully. And he points to uh, the many wars uh, because he argues that states are ultimately um, concerned about their own self-interest. So if there's a threat to them, whether it's over resources or, or just straight territory uh, or population, the, prison, the presence of other states are an immediate threat. So at no, no matter what, no matter what they say, uh, whether they, they say they're allies or humanitarian, whatever, uh, at some point uh, they are going to become or are always competition, the, the states between each other. So like you could take two countries, France, Germany. Um, they are necessarily, because they both exist, uh, as state systems, they are competitors and enemies of one another. Uh, so they will, at some point, fight over territory or ideals. And when you mobilize uh, populations and resources against one another, uh, you create, uh, in, in Bakunin's uh, opinion, far more violence uh, and catastrophe and death than you do um, without it. So uh, these are going to drive, uh, drive state-driven uh, wars. And he says, even if they claim to be <clears throat> acting in uh, the interest of all humanity or others, that states cannot actually do this. They are more concerned with their own continuation of existence than um, the, the, the improvement of all humanity or whatever. Uh, and he points to patriotism as an example of that uh, because he actually uh, says that states sort of indoctrinate citizens to believe that uh, Things that are more normally considered immoral, like uh, killing, for example, is actually okay. In fact, it's more than it's okay if you're killing for your state, like in a war to protect it or expand against another state, for example, or oppose somebody who wants to uh, have a revolution or change it, that uh, it's actually patriotic and the highest honor to, uh, to kill for or even die for your state. Uh, and Dr. Assistants believe that uh, death uh, for the state, and again, that could mean killing or, or sacrificing yourself, is the, uh, the highest honor. So not only does he say that it, it convinces you that you should fight for your country and that that's okay, that's in fact moral rather than immoral, that it actually produces more. So that's part of his argument uh, why he opposed the state and why he believed that humans didn't need a state and that they should li live uh, as decentralized, non-state, uh, communities that would sort of determine their own uh, production and, and, and ways of life in a non-coercive fashion, essentially, these local federations, all right, uh, or decentralized federations. So uh, that was his overall plan uh, and his overall, the overall reason why he opposed uh, states uh, and was an anarchist. Uh, and you should know he in particular was a, a very active, highly active individual, also actually highly active activist. We got a little redundant, but uh, he was uh, any time he was basically, and so was Marx to some degree, but certainly uh, Bakunin far more uh, than Marx. Marx, or sorry, Bakunin was just waiting for revolutions to uh, develop. So anytime there was uh, an unsettled, because uh, he, uh, like Marx, generally believed this was going to come from the more working class base, uh, because they were the ones that were being exploited the most obviously by state systems. Nonetheless, he was sort of looking for any working class. Uh, or, or, or any sort of revolution that wanted to overthrow the state system. He attempted to uh, uh, help that out. So he would, he 
he was a participant uh, and a supporter of the Polish revolts against the Russians. Um, the Revolution of 1848, I believe he was in the Czech area for that one. But he was, uh, he was basically doing his best to uh, uh, join and foster uh, revolutionary activity throughout Europe. And there was plenty to be had uh, in the mid, certainly the mid uh, 19th century, even the early 19th century, uh, and uh, even in the late a bit. The, the mid was kind of the high point. Uh, nonetheless, he was uh, uh, looking to uh, foster revolution, which, by the way, made him very unpopular, obviously, to the governments of Europe. So he was often uh, exiled and uh, forced to live abroad, kind of like Marx was. But Marx did settle in London with Engels, um, or at least funded by Engels, looking to foster revolution across the uh, across Europe. Um, and uh, he was also very active, very active in uh, worker movements. There were several local and international organizations that, uh, like the Industrial Workers of the World, that attempted to uh, sort of unify the working class and move for reform, or you know, in Marx and um, Bakunin's uh, eyes, either a proletariat revolution for Marx or some sort of anti-state revolution uh, for Bakunin. Uh, they were very active in, in those communities trying to foster and garner support for uh, changing the, the way things were. Uh, Marx, though, very specifically believed that change oriented towards this, this, this localized communal um, uh, ideal had to come through the state necessarily. Like the proletariat had to rise up, temporarily be the state functioning as the proletariat, or sorry, the dictatorship of the proletariat, uh, and then uh, would have gradually lead to this, you know, disestablished state communal society. Um, Bakunin though was very critical of Marx for this reason, uh, because he was very much opposed to any state. Doesn't matter if it's a proletariat-driven uh, state or not. Um, so I want to point out that he was uh, very critical of Marx. Critical of Marx. Uh, he believed, or he opposed, any state form for the reasons we just mentioned. Uh, they're going to use it to enslave people and. Um, exploit people and um, justify violence. So, uh, and actually, Bakunin is pretty accurate in this uh, um, uh, prediction. Bakunin predicted accurately that the uh, Marxist revolution, if it were carried out, and it, and it does in the Soviet Union and China and others, it's not going to be a dictatorship of the proletariat, as in like, you know, the proletariat rises up as a class and takes over the government and does things uh, relatively equally or evenly, uh, progressing towards this more communist state. Uh, he actually predicted that it would not be for the proletariat, it would, be, uh, uh, it would be in control of the proletariat. So he believed that the dictatorship would not comp be comprised of the proletariat for the proletariat. He believed it would be uh, controlled by uh, likely a select few, but certainly the state would function to control the proletariat again. So not a dictatorship for the proletariat, but a dictatorship of the proletariat uh, in that they would be uh, abused and exploited uh, and subject to violence just as any of the other states were. And he was right about that. That happened under Leninist Marxism uh, and Stalinism, as well as Maoism, and all those uh, in Cuba, Vietnam, uh, wherever it might be, Ethiopia, um, North Korea, all of these places, China are all going to experience that um, um, that formula or that prediction that that Bakunin pointed out uh, well before it actually occurred. Uh, in fact, um, uh, I don't know how much of an adherent he is of Bakunin's beliefs, but I know he's certainly an anarchist. He certainly um, agrees with Bakunin's assessment and criticizes uh, socialist regimes of the 20th century for adopting that sort of elite vanguard approach, or uh, you know, as like Lenin or Stalin or Mao sort of like took the reins. For the for the the stupid um, proletariat class and decided what they would do for them, uh, he uh, uh, agrees uh, with that. And that's Noam Chomsky, who's a who's a, a an anarchist certainly and uh, one who uh, is on the uh, radical left end of the spectrum. Uh, but he's very popular and he's uh, one who supports, generally speaking, uh, this more creative and cooperative uh, human nature uh, that. Bakunin and others agreed with, and he also agreed that uh, the, the Marxist strategy was not the implementation of the, the actual uh, practice of, of socialism or anarchism or, or communism, uh, and that Bakunin was right that it would devolve into a, a tyranny uh, against the proletariat, not for it. Uh, so that's essentially 
uh, Bakunin uh, and anarchy. And I want to point out too that a lot of the uh, violence of the uh, the terrorist activity that in the 19th century and 20th century uh, were driven by um, anarchists because it was very hard for them to foster any sort of unified like uh, militaristic uh, organizations. It was mostly splinter cells of um, uh, terrorist activity. Uh, and they would, of course, attempt to uh, attack state officials and um, um, uh, organizations or buildings and attempt to discourage or, or, or topple uh, governments. So they assassinated several world leaders, including a US president, um, a few kings and princes in, uh, world, in, uh, in uh, Europe, including the um, uh, Archduke of, uh, which is the runner up to the throne in Austria Hungary, which helped spark World War I. So they were, uh, they were pretty uh, feared and, and relatively active in the 19th and early 20th century. So anarchists were responsible for uh, the majority of terrorist activity in the uh, 19th and early 20th century. And again, they, they believe that uh, the use of violence to achieve these ends is um, permittable. Uh, and that's kind of partly what defines the radical right and the radical left, or from your perspective, the radical left and the radical right, is uh, that they uh, believe in these uh, generally collectiv collectivist ideals. Um, and and I, obviously, anarchists and uh, communists do support some sort of uh, individual, or Marxists rather, some sort of individual uh, freedom and choice, but uh, they're, they're much more oriented towards the collective uh, and, and cooperation, and they are um, willing to use, generally speaking, any means necessary to achieve that, including uh, violence. And you see that in many of the uh, Marxist regimes and fascist regimes of the 20th century, and you see that here with the terrorist activity of, of some anarchists. There are peaceful anarchists, though, so I don't want to make you think that, that if you're an anarchist, it means you're a terrorist. Uh, there are absolutely pacifists. Uh, uh, who, are, who are anarchists and uh, endorse this ideology. Uh, but that's essentially what it is. Um, and much like Marxism, there are some issues with it. Um, and I encourage you, of course, to, to look into these um, theories yourself. I would, of course, uh, not suggest the violent uh, characteristics or traits of them. Uh, but certainly look into why uh, you think um, these theories might be correct uh, or incorrect. So I've given you the opinions and perspective um, of Bakunin and, and most anarchists. But like Marx, I'll show you some of the things that people criticize them for or, or think um, may uh, um, hurt their, their argument. Um, so anarchism, so some of the uh, uh, criticisms of it. Uh, number one, many people point to the fact that um, it has not actually worked across the uh, decades. It has not developed uh, or um, or succeeded. That's generally a pretty good indicator that it probably isn't going to be a successful model. Uh, and, and many people who are anarchists would, would argue, of course, that they, most of these attempts have been stymied by uh, the, uh, the, 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 the existing states attempting to protect their, um, their social structures and, and their inherent power. Uh, and perhaps that's true. Uh, but there haven't been that many successful attempts to uh, foster a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? thriving or flourishing uh, anarchist system in that you have these, you know, collectively cooperative driven non-coerced uh, hierarchy uh, um, entities, whether they are utopian socialist uh, uh, societies or whether they are um, some sort of, uh, of, of, of decentralized federation that exists, uh, no such one has succeeded on a large scale to the point that it, it provides a, a, a replicable model uh, for others. Um, and also, too, another criticism is uh, their view of human nature is inaccurate. Um, contemporary psychology is, has really showed us quite well that um, the Marxists are wrong and uh, the uh, fascists are wrong, uh, and so are the, um, the classical uh, liberals and Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, see, Enlightenment thinkers and classical liberals were wrong that we're not entirely rational because we are not. Uh, so we're not just rational, and we're definitely have a lot of irrational motives, uh, but we're not entirely altruistic uh, or self-centered. And that's where also the, uh, the far left and far right are incorrect as well. We're not entirely altruistic either. So we absolutely have uh, a combination of drives and mechanisms in our brain uh, that um, uh, push us or compel us to be 
either more altruistic or more self-centered than other individuals, uh, depending on, of course, our own uh, heritability, environmental factors, uh, and development, as well as uh, sociocultural factors, too. So human nature uh, is mixed, uh, not purely uh, self-interest uh, or purely altruistic and cooperative. Uh, and why that matters um, is if you set up a series of communities and societies that are um, predicated on the fact that people will act cooperatively and not in their own self-interest, uh, if you uh, set up a society like that that has no mechanisms to prevent it, uh, these individuals will exist uh, and um, taint that system over time or just outright uh, take over that system and, and, and restart another form of coercive state societies. Uh, so, uh, and that, that of course makes the uh, um, uh, decentralized federations uh, vulnerable uh, to, uh, to exploitation or, or takeover. I don't want to say naive, and, but some of it is naive, but they're going to be vulnerable to being taken over. And then, of course, what would prevent uh, human history from repeating itself? Um, Human history was at one point uh, stateless. Uh, there are still stateless societies that exist today, and we know quite a bit about them, past and present. Um, but what would prevent the same thing from occurring? So if the whole world eventually uh, became this uh, uh, collectivist um, set of societies and, and decentralized federations, what would stop any one of them from uh, practicing those regular state uh, expansionist practices, because if they did start doing that, uh, and let's say uh, one of these um, federations became um, driven almost like by nationalism or, or self-interest to take over another, uh, and once they start that process, uh, what's to stop them from, from, from absorbing all of the local decentralized federations uh, from one another? Uh, so uh, what would stop the reemergence of state systems? because uh, they'd have no mechanism to stop that. They wouldn't have a military or organization. So if one or multiple groups started doing that, it would just essentially repeat history uh, if that were to occur. Uh, number, another one too is uh, who's going to uh, maintain uh, cohesion, maintains uniformity and cohesion. One of the benefits of a state system is uh, you have common ways of communicating, uh, common ways of trading uh, and engaging in commerce, and you have um, common units uh, for, for use for transportation and building. So for example, um, one of the major, major advantages these centralized states have is we have first of all common laws and, and that helps maintain the order if, if, if you believe that human nature is mixed, which psychological research indicates it is. Uh, but also, if you have a bunch of uh, decentralized federations, they're gonna lose their uniformity. So you're not gonna have uh, uh, organized uh, interconnections, so transportation communication between them, who's going to operate and mandate and, and uh, maintain the uh, uh, transportation networks, uh, whether they are roads or power lines, whatever they might be, um, who's going to cover them in between, how are they going to keep them uniform, like uh, you know, who picks which side of the road we all drive on throughout the rest of the world or in whatever region, uh, who picks uh, the size of the uh, wires uh, or the frequency of the wires uh, or the uh, interchangeable parts in um, uh, mechanized uh, um, and machinery. Uh, those things all make it way easier for us to uh, uh, share and produce these things on a large scale. Uh, and you'd be inevitably forced to eventually just have only the resources available in your immediate location or surrounding locations. Um, another problem is, what am I forgetting here? Oh yeah, um, uh, how do you, uh, how to avoid local disasters? Or regional disasters. So let's say that there's a, a, a regional, I mean, I can mean like a large region, like there's flooding or an earthquake uh, or some sort of large scale pestilence or some sort of environmental factor that uh, could cripple entire nations and often requires aid, even if it is delayed or imperfect. They do generally get aid from uh, the UN and other nations in an organized manner. Uh, if you have a disease outbreak or something like that, uh, and every group is sort of on their own uh, to, to fend for it, how are they gonna organize any sort of support or aid for those other groups? How are they gonna be made known about it? 
Uh, and what if it's affecting a whole region so all of those federations are caught in it and they have no real network with which to uh, communicate or receive aid from, uh, from others? And why would they be motivated to do that? Uh, they might be because you see them as in favor of, of, of human collectivism but, uh, or collectivization, but th that makes it a complicated issue. And the last one is going to be um, uh, what about regional stagnation uh, obsolescence, so becoming obsolete, uh, or um, dependence. What I mean by that is certain regions only have access to certain resources, um, so perhaps uh, they run out of a particular resource, and that was the main source of, of production and, and, and wealth and affluence for them. So now they're forced to move somewhere else, uh, so they're going to inevitably infringe on somebody else's uh, commune. Uh, and maybe they're willing to accept that, maybe they are, but maybe they're not able to or willing to accept a whole influx of people. Uh, what happens when the industries you're dependent on for affluence in your area and flourishing um, uh, become out of date? Like let's say uh, you are big on, I don't know, rubber production because they use that for tires, but let's say people stop using cars or we develop some other way that we don't need rubber. Now what are you gonna be dependent on? So if you, you hope you have something else to produce and provide for people, what are you gonna do if yours becomes obsolete? Um, and uh, how are you going to, of course, uh, continue to develop in a, in a positive way and not fall backwards and go into local recessions and, again, have to disperse across the world and don't know how other groups are going to accept you or not accept you, um, and then, of course, if they even have room to, uh, to, to facilitate that. Those are a whole host of problems that, while also still problems for our present world, they're much easier when you have these organized, centralized, unified systems that can communicate uh, and they have these uh, common practices and need some measurement and exchange uh, so that they can provide aid uh, and be interdependent across the globe. Uh, so yeah, those are some complications uh, that would inevitably arise with such a system. But again, uh, feel free to look into and or debate or think about these issues on your own. Uh, those are just some basic ideas. So that is anarchism. Zionism. So we know nationalism in the 19th century is just infecting European society. I think infecting is the right word to use, at least the way that they were using it. Uh, it's infecting European society. It's a very counter-enlightenment movement. Um, if I'm in Germany and I unify, yay, I'm happy if I'm German. But what happens if I'm not German and I'm now in Germany? Well, I'm already living there. I don't care about the traditions as much. Why might this be a problem for me if I'm living in Germany or France or Italy or anywhere where they have this majority ethnicity that's, that's a dominant uh, culture. Again, I'm already living in that culture most likely. Why is it a problem now that I've gone from Prussia to Germany or Piedmont to Italy? Because now you're discriminating Automatically? <coughs> but you're right that that will be a problem. So we have the rise of nationalism. So she's saying something about discrimination. What, 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 what might happen in these countries if I'm not that majority population, ethnicity, culture, whatever? All the laws that the That's really vague. I don't know what that means. Um, they might drive you out of their... Uh, Who? The government. Why? Because you're not... Um, you're not that dominant race. Okay, there we go. Uh, that's a possibility. So, uh, minority groups... While, while people are caught in this, like, enthusiasm and zeal for, like, yay German culture in Germany and yay Italian culture in Italy and yay whatever you are, whatever area, uh, even the Polish people who don't have a state yet. Uh, if I'm a minority group, it now just got worse for me because I now was already probably on the fringe of society and probably targets of discrimination. But now it's it's like a national scale, like they're unified uh, wholly. And I've just gotten much, much, much smaller uh, when all of the common people have united around me and now it's just me. So what are some uh, populations that might be Facing this discrimination, don't just give me one. Although obviously we have a primary one to talk about here. Jews. Jews. <coughs> yeah, depending on where you are, any other race could be. I do have a lot. I do have Germans in other parts of Europe that, in like Russia and Hungary and Romania, that are going to be the minority group. I've got uh, um, what else do I have? 
I've got, you know, Czech people and Polish people in German areas, so, like they're gonna be the minority uh, in those areas. So yeah, so minority groups uh, are going to be increasingly face, increasingly face discrimination. Uh, that means any minority group, but uh, the biggest one, the biggest single minority group in Europe, one that doesn't have its own like culture and be like, this is our state, let's go here, uh, is gonna be the Jews, which are spread throughout Central Europe uh, and in Western Europe too. And uh, well, throughout all of Europe. Most oh, by the way, why are Jewish people in Europe in the first place? Jewish diaspora. Yeah, the Jewish diaspora, right? Rome came and Hulk smashed Israel after their rebellion. And they uh, spread throughout the Mediterranean, which back then was just the Roman Empire. Um, they were kind of throughout the whole Mediterranean, but what drove them out of the non-European parts of the Mediterranean? I'll give you credit for that, by the way, because you got that right. So Jewish diaspora sends them all over the Mediterranean. So then what, what causes them to sort of densely form here in uh, Europe? <coughs> Yep, the, uh, the Muslim conquest, right? They chased them out of North Africa, the Middle East, Anatolia largely, uh, and Europe became a place that the Jews were essentially, I don't wanna say stuck in, but most of them moved to, right? Because it was less oppressive for the most part for them to live in Europe because there was no, you know, Dimi status or, or Gizia or anything like that that would uh, oppress them. Not that the Christians in Europe were friendly towards them, but they didn't have explicit policies against them in all Christian kingdoms. Right. Particularly when I go to like places like the Netherlands, right after 1648, religious freedom sounds great. Uh, a lot of Jews end up going there. All right, so more to you, sir. Uh, increasingly face discrimination, and the Jews are the uh, largest uh, minority group that's spread across Europe. But yeah, they were spread throughout the Mediterranean by the Romans, and then of course the uh, uh, Muslim conflict conquests drive a lot of them. Uh, into Europe specifically. So I've got a large population there. By the way, Jews that live in Europe uh, are called uh, Ashkenazi Jews. I might be spelling that wrong, but that's what they're known as. All right. Um, they are actually known for a mutation in their DNA that makes them more common. It makes it more common for them to have a couple of uh, debilitating genetic diseases. But that's only if they have two of this trait. If they have one of this trait, which is common, it makes them substantially smarter on average. So there's a reason why I'm mentioning this, by the way. So if I took the average IQ of like the world or Europe, it's 100. That's the whole point of an IQ test is 100 is average. If you're below that, you're below average. If you're above that, you're above average, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the average IQ for an Ashkenazi Jew is uh, ranges between 108 and 115, which doesn't sound like that much of a difference. Because if I take a 100 IQ person, 110, there's not a huge difference, but it shifts their whole curve over. So let me show you real quick. This is like some AP Psych stuff, but if 100's the average, uh, 140 is my top 1% marker. Everybody that's 140 or above is the smartest 1% of people. And then of course, 60 is the uh, opposite on the lower end. Um, this is the average curve-ish, like this. This is everybody else. The Ashkenazi Jew curve is moved over to the right slightly. So it's like this. So this is like 110. It's more like right here. What is that? Uh, that's actually a little off. Hold on. It's not quite that big. Hold on. All right, what difference does that make? It's like they're almost the same. Yeah, okay, so what it does is it really changes the extremes. So the amount of people that I have beyond this super smart 140 marker or 150 marker, uh, are there more or less Ashkenazi Jews compared to everybody else? There's a lot more, right? So they have a smarter population, but more specifically at the extremes, they have a lot of super smart people. So as a result, and by the way, this has been a, a big reason why uh, far right wings have wing groups like Hitler and, and, and not whatnot, have thought Jews were like somehow conspiring and controlling things and they need to get rid of them, some ridiculous thing. Uh, what happens is this population is just uh, incredibly smart. So back in the uh, <clears throat> feudal era when I had guilds controlling everything and uh, I didn't really have like a free market and banks and things like that, did I have opportunity to do really well if I was very smart? No, why not? Yeah, no social mobility opportunity. What about when I remove those barriers and I allow 
people to go out on their own motivations and intelligence. How do you think the Jewish population is going to do? They're going to do incredibly well, right? And they do. So uh, most of the uh, competency-based positions, like you know, high-end positions like lawyers, bankers, uh, um, doctors, anything that requires a great amount of thought and competency, uh, Jews very disproportionately hold those positions. And again, racist right-wingers think it's because of some Jewish conspiracy, but it's really as simple as the mutations that group has had make it just a little bit smarter than average, which means they have a lot more people at the high end so that these banking, lawyer, doctor positions, whatever, uh, are disproportionately uh, held by them. So what tends to happen when you free up your society is uh, the Jewish population does rather well does well financially. So let's pretend I'm a super nationalist French or Polish or German or anybody. And I'm like, yeah, uh, German people are the best and German culture is the best. And then I look around and I see that most of these positions of intelligence and wealth are held by Jewish people. Do you think they're gonna be super happy about that? No, totally incorrect in their anger. Nonetheless, that's what it's gonna result in, right? Uh, so if anything ever goes wrong, Let's say I have a panic and a recession, or I have a disease outbreak. Who are they gonna blame for that? Jews. The Jews, right. They, they, we don't know about or believe in things like bacteria theory and stuff like that. So they think it's some conspiracy by this controlling minority group that's uh, an outsider. So every time something bad happens, when they look to blame somebody, uh, Europeans, especially in the 19th century, they're gonna try to uh, blame the Jewish people for that. Because again, there's a couple reasons. Number one, they're different. Uh, and number two, they seem to hold a lot of positions of authority and power and competence. So they take out their frustrations on the Jewish population. So uh, we have several instances of this in Europe already. The Inquisition's already targeted them in Spain. We've had a few things called pogroms where you have something bad like a disease outbreak happen and you blame the Jewish people and people just go out and round up all the Jews they can and destroy their stuff and or kill them. So they've already had to face Historically, they've already faced things like the uh, Inquisition in Spain. Uh, they've also faced pogroms, but or pogroms. But even more severely is going to be outright state policies against Jewish people that discriminate them, like don't allow them to come into the country or don't allow them to hold certain jobs, blame them for problems and imprison them. Uh, and we've got two uh, good examples, well, they're bad examples, but good examples of this, this what's called anti-Semitism or uh, racism against Jewish people. So anti-Semitism during this uh, era in which uh, Semitism is going to greatly increase during uh, the nationalistic 19th century. Okay, so we do have this. Um, there is one specific example of the, oh, what's the name of the party? The Austrian Social Democratic Party? No. The Austrian Social, Christian Social Party? I think that's what it's called. Anyways, Karl Luger's the guy's name. He becomes the mayor of Vienna. Um, he is incredibly anti-Semitic. Anti -Semitic. Uh, so Karl Luger becomes the mayor of Vienna. Uh, he does some good things, like he modernizes Vienna. Yay, good job, you. But he's also an anti-Semite. Uh, he's very much a supporter of the idea that Jews are out to control and manipulate and uh, um, uh, bring down Austria or, or, or Germany or wherever they're, where they are. So he's going to deliberately uh, ban or limit immigration of Jews from other parts of Europe. So he's going to uh, restrict Jewish immigration. Oh, by the way, the party itself is Austrian uh, uh, Christian Social Party. Austrian Social... Christian party. Uh, it's an anti-Semitic party. That's one of their platforms is they're against Jewish people and Jewish culture and any conspiracies that blame Jews for whatever problems they might have. All right, so definitely remember him. And also remember a, a massive political scandal referred to as the uh, Dreyfus Affair. This is, I'll, I'll try to make it short. In the 1890s, I think it's 94 to 1908, this poor guy, he had just the worst scenario. Uh, he was a Jewish officer in the French army, and uh, there were some, uh, like a high up official, and there were some secrets that were leaked to the Germans. Like somebody, the Germans paid some Frenchmen to uh, uh, get them secrets uh, to their military plans or, or, or technology. Uh, so the French were embarrassed by this, that the Germans got a hold of this information. Uh, so if they got to blame somebody, 
Who do you think they're going to blame? The Jewish person in the army, right? Now, he didn't even do it. It was a, it was a genuine French person that did this or, or people that did this. But nonetheless, the French don't want to blame a Frenchman for it or, or see that there's some sort of weakness in the French people. So they are going to uh, uh, blame Alfred Dreyfus uh, for this, this leaking of, the, uh, of um, uh, information. He's, he's labeled a traitor, essentially. Uh, labeled traitor. All right, so leaked military secrets. They blame Dreyfus, totally innocent. Um, he's lucky they didn't kill him. Well, I don't know if he's lucky because he had to spend six or seven years in a South American prison, and that is just about as bad as it gets because there's no French people around. Uh, you're exposed to insane levels of heat and tropical disease. Um, I can't imagine the facilities there were very humane because there's nobody around to say, hey, you can't treat them like this. They're just off in South America in French Guiana. Uh, so you had to endure this, but thankfully, some people in the state weren't anti-Semitic, and they found out that this was a, uh, a plot. Um, they used him as a scapegoat. He didn't actually do it. Uh, the word got out, hit the newspapers. It became uh, international news, and they do actually exonerate this guy and let him out. But if I'm a Jewish person in, um, in Europe, whether it's France or, or wherever, yeah, I should put that, by the way, it's in France, not like Germany or something like that. France. Uh, what message does this send to me? Like, yeah, okay, they, they found out about Exposed and he gets to go free after he wasted 10 years of his life. But what, uh, what does that tell me as a Jew in, in Europe? Yeah, time to get out, right? Because it's, it's, nationalism is not a good formula uh, for success if you're a minority group in one of these nations, right? So uh, it is going to, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Motivate European Jews uh, to leave Europe. But they don't want to just go somewhere else and be persecuted. They want their own state. And that desire to form their own state in what was uh, Israel in the Middle East on the Mediterranean coast, what's that movement called? This is the radical movement. Zionist. Good. You got a person that helped uh, propel that? No. no? Do you? Thomas. Good guess. Herzl. Theodore Herzl, yeah. So this movement... Uh, this movement to form a Jewish state where the Jews can be the minority group, or sorry, majority group, uh, is known as Zionism. And they, it's, again, a desire for a home state for Jewish people in what was uh, ancient Israel. Okay. Uh, and, yes, one of the people that helped drive this was a guy named Theodore Herzl. And uh, I do have quite a few very wealthy uh, Jewish families, right? Because once you free up regulations, again, they tend to do rather well, whether it's banking or doctors or whatever, whatever, or lawyers, whatever position it is, uh, a lot of these high paying positions are going to be um, earned by uh, this incredibly uh, intelligent population in Europe. Okay. So who do they cut a deal with to eventually get a state over there? in Israel. Great Britain. Great Britain, why? Why would Great Britain agree to do this? It's kind of a future event, because this is actually 1917 when they officially say, all right, here's what we're going to do. Oh, so they can finance them for like wars or anything. Exactly. So what they're going to do is they're going to negotiate with a lot of the wealthy Jewish businesses and families in Great Britain <clears throat> and elsewhere in Europe that if they give them financial support for World War I, which is a long ridiculously exhausting four-year conflict between Britain, France, and Germany <clears throat> on the Western Front. Um, if they donate, <clears throat> so Jewish families are going to uh, donate to uh, the British war effort, British World War I effort, uh, in exchange for future access to territory. So the idea was, and they formed this uh, agreement uh, secretly with the United States and France, it's called the Sykes-Picot Agreement, they basically decide, all right, well, we're going to win World War II. World War I is pretty clear by 1916, 1917, they're going to win eventually. Uh, they're like, all right, well, we're going to take the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire's territory in the Middle East, because it does have quite a nice chunk of oil there. And hey, now we'll have a hold of ancient Israel, and we can start sending those Jewish families back to uh, um, Israel to start their new state uh, and, and honor our word um, for them donating to our war effort. So that declaration, by the way, where they officially, the government said, all right, we are going to help start uh, uh, 
in helping uh, Jewish people immigrate to this uh, state here in Palestine, in Israel. Uh, that's called the Balfour De Declaration. So that's when officially, publicly, in 1917, the British government said, we are going to uh, protect this area as we own it after the Ottoman Empire loses it, and we're going to allow Jewish people to settle there uh, and begin their own state, which eventually becomes Israel in 1980, no, 1948, I think is when it become. 47 or 48, I think it's 48. Regardless, uh, just now the Balfour De Declaration is officially when the British government's like, all right, we're going to uh, support a Jewish settlement in Palestine, which again was ancient Israel.